um, recorded video. All right. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Jacob Watson, and uh, I'm the editor of Apology Anglicana, and this is John Fisher 2.0. I don't know his real name. Um, I don't think I've heard his real name. Then it's, it's working. The then it's working. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is anonymous representing John Fisher 2.0. Um, do you want to uh, give background? I think if they follow me, they, they kind of know who you are, but do you want to give any background on your channel? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, my, so my name is John Fisher 2.0. That's the handle I go by on the YouTubes, the Twitters, and all the other social medias. Um, I have a YouTube channel called Original When Productions, where I talk about a variety of issues, so whatever piques my interest at some point of my life. Mm -hmm. So early on in the channel, I got into um, everything from uh, philosophy of religion. So that's just uh, reading a lot of literature on what philosophers have to say about um, how to understand uh, ideas of or create models of God, uh, models of the Trinity, models of the Incarnation, models of biblical... Uh, understanding biblical inspiration, all that stuff. They basically don't take anything theologically for granted. And then they move into their theology and so on and so forth. Um, personally, I'm of the opinion that um, theology starts first, and then we use philosophy as a defense. Philosophy is the handmaid into the theological science, but that's uh, more of a methodological dispute. You still need to engage with the arguments. So whatever the methodology, the arguments are the arguments. Then I went through a period where I engaged with more traditionalists and set of contest types. Um, in fact, one of my uh, projects that stemmed from discussing the validity of Anglican orders was with set of contests. So um, set of contests usually use those arguments to attack um, the Nuvis Ordo uh, rights for orders, and I responded to them. I think the most powerful defender of that was Father Chikata. Um, he's no longer with us, but uh, he provided some fairly interesting arguments, but ultimately I found them unpersuasive, especially when you read um, documents like Lumen Gentium uh, and get a context of the developments in the Second Vatican Council. Of course, because Father Chikata is not um, someone who recognizes the Second Vatican Council and just stuck with pre-Vatican II manuals, I found that there was an amazing weakness with his perspective, so it's very easy to undercut, um, especially when you look at the form. Um, the If you look at the Second Vatican Council, the sign of the bishops, um, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the indelible mark of the bishops is the fact that they are tasked with the mission of spreading the church and they contain all the other orders. So there is that development. And I, I don't think it's something you catch really in the prior man, in the prior theological work, because that was, that question was more open with people on various sides of that issue, but I, I won't touch too much into that one. Um, then I kind of went into a period of um, just engaging with Protestants, and then I went to another period. Now I'm just back at the period of engaging with um, uh, Muslims, and now I'm engaging with you because I, I went through various periods, so I'm like a jack-of-all-trades guy. So my channel, you'll have tons of those issues. If I, I push everyone to look at my stuff on uh, the on orders of, of the Catholic Church because that's the stuff I work most on. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I I think I'm I'm not like an amazing expert at uh, uh, in terms of all rights, but I think I have a fairly good grasp to have at this discussion. And uh, yeah, so that's my background. I'm an, a convert to Catholicism from Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, I'm not going to claim to be this amazing Eastern Orthodox guy who was just convinced and read up on everything, just became a Catholic. Uh, my uh, my reasons for converting were more personal. And we're more centered around just how the practice of the Catholic Church, how it was more uh, pastoral and more ordained towards confession, where I didn't really find that in Orthodoxy. I called the Latin approach all legalistic if you want, but actually having those open signs were very helpful to me, um, uh, just personally as a layman. So I found the fruit there. Um, I'm not saying I'm not open to being having my mind changed. I just haven't been persuaded back yet. And let's see, um, 
yeah, that is kind of like a short right. explanation on my, my own journey uh, into Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, as you would call it, but Catholicism nonetheless. Yeah. Romanism, papism. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's cool. So you were raised Orthodox. Yeah. Oh. Very, <laughs> fairly nominal, though. Like, uh, I uh, like uh, my friend. Like I have a friend, Biscat. He was a he went through an or Eastern Orthodox period, and I think he knows more about Orthodox theology proper than I do. Well, I'm fairly certain he does. So that's that, generally how it works out. Yeah. Yeah. He's someone I would suggest people go to as opposed to me. But uh, yeah, um, that's generally been my journey. Cool. Nice. Thanks for sharing. So, uh, so this discussion really started on Twitter, where all good discussions occur, mm -hmm. um, because Twitter is the best. But uh, and it was really on Traditionis Custodis, right, and um, its relationship with mm -hmm. like the rest of the Catholic tradition. Uh, do you want to summarize the the point you were making and yeah, um, in, the, in the clash there? I do want to, I do want to, but I actually want to get something straight here because I read a blog post you wrote on Traditionis Custodis, and you compared it to uh, the motu proprio given by Pope Benedict uh, beforehand. Mm -hmm. And your general argument was that there's a contradiction between the first articles present within the two. I get that argument, but the argument and the argument started on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, at least by Father James, was um, Traditionis Custodis. I'm butchering the Latin there. Uh, mm -hmm. invalidates the um, the Trinitine Mass. Now, I, I read nothing in there about invalidating the Trinitine Mass, but that's what uh, Father James wrote. He said it invalidates mm -hmm. it. Now, I don't think you use that language, and I don't want to make his argument your argument. Is that the argument you were making? Uh, so, so Father make... James um, has the semantic range of valid in Father mm -hmm. James' thought. Mm. is wide it's yeah. very wide uh when father james at least when i see him talk about these issues mm -hmm. he, when he's saying the word valid he is saying he can mean either valid or licit in the ways that we would talk about it yeah um, um yeah so so i wouldn't make the argument that it's invalid right because that yeah. means that the sacramental effect doesn't happen at all yeah and and i don't think whatever you want to say about Bergoglio, I, I don't think that Pope Francis would say that Christ is not present at a, at a traditional Roman liturgy, right? That's kind of a bit far field. Yeah. Um, I guess for me, I would, I would point out, right. One, there's like, there's the parent contradiction in, mm -hmm. um, in teaching, right? Be, not in legislation. And I would make that difference that yes. this is a difference of doctrine, not a difference of, of, um, discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I was Roman Catholic when Traditionis Custodis uh, was um, mm -hmm. was promulgated. And I remember everyone, it was right, the, the, the sort of what everyone was saying was like, this is the death of the hermeneutic of continuity. Mm. Right. Um, but my argument goes even further, and we can get to this um, mm -hmm. in a bit, but it's that uh, Pope Francis, his entire Papal magisterium is founded on modernism, right? That would be mm -hmm. my argument that er, that uh, all these changes that we're seeing in doctrine are actually just modernism being uh, promulgated from Rome. Right. So we we have to be careful what the term modernism means because, like, on its face, it just means oh, whatever occurs in the twenty first century. Like that, that's yeah. not what modernism means. Like, mm -hmm. if you look up the old Catholic encyclopedia, uh, the modernists had, I, I believe, like um, like. Th three things that bound them together. The first thing was um, an anti-metaphysical bias. So they believe they're metaphysical agnostics. They think that, you know, you can't know about the world in and of itself past uh, German idealism, but mm -hmm. rather you had to, um, but rather, uh, be, and because of that, they kind of stuck with, um, with uh, religion from, I, I, like, if you're a con, something like a moralist perspective or uh, or something like with pure epistemology. And, like, that's one aspect of it. The second aspect was that church teaching could actually be changed either in open contradiction to what it past, taught in the past or 
uh, add new things, just as long as it didn't contradict. Of course, the proper idea of continuity is that whatever genus is there in the early, whatever is taught and promulgated today is a definition that has its genus or origin in, in the deposit of faith. So for example, uh, if you look at uh, the Immaculate Conception, um, Aquinas would agree with modern Catholic thought, uh, as it was promulgated and defined, that Mary is uh, sinless. That is, she was born, that is, she did not commit any venial sins or mortal sins. Where he would disagree is that um, it, when she was being formed in the womb, she had sins and those sins were uh, taken away. Like that for him, that's one reading. Another reading is that they were removed with uh, with uh, Gabriel saying she was full of grace. Like these are all the ideas that Mary is sinless for uh, sin that uh, Mary is sinless at that point. But the Church determines out of the genus that she was sinless. In what sense? It gives a more specific yeah. different. It it gives the it it specifies the difference. Yeah. Uh, the the modernists don't didn't agree with that idea either. So for them, so, and there was a third quality I can't well, remember I, off the top of my head, but yeah, that's generally what modernism is. So um, yeah, that's the case. I think what your claim is uh, would be that Pope Francis is teaching something doctrinally that is at odds with Pope Benedict in such a way that it is a contradiction, if not well, a, a difference, well, even that's, if it could be harmonized. Well, that's my argument, but yeah. that's not modernism, right? Okay. Um, because ultra-Montanist in the Roman Church would say that church teaching, like the uh, papal teaching can't be wrong, but mm. that's not, strictly speaking, the only position that exists in the Roman Church, right? So, mm. uh, for example, Lefebvre, it, uh, carries the argument that papal teaching can be wrong. And that's not contradictory to anything that a Roman Catholic has to believe, right? That's a mm. pretty, especially now, it's a pretty vanilla um, position to hold in the Roman church. Uh, when I say modernism, I mean specifically uh, the modernism in the sense of Pashendi, that it is um, the basis of truth is not the conformity of idea to reality, but the conformity of idea to either sentiment or more specifically um, mm -hmm. cu current progress or the sentiment of the time. Right. right? So, um, so, so that's, and that's where you get the idea that truth develops. So something's not true if it's not current. So mm -hmm. truths and doctrines are going to change as mm -hmm. time goes on in order to conform with the times. Right. right? So that's what I argue happens in, uh, for example, in Traditionis, and that's what I argue happen. I also argue it with the um, revision of the death penalty, right? That's pretty clear, right? Because of our new modern understanding of human dignity, as opposed to the old one, we now have to change our teaching. And, and that's why I argue happens in Traditionis. Mm -hmm. Now, then, yeah. and under that then, it's, it's also, a, that leads to a doctrinal error, or at least a contradiction, but I don't think that th that can exist in Roman Catholic thought. It just can't exist in, Ro in um, ultra Montanist thought. If that does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. So uh, you know, a couple of things I want to touch on: the idea that it corresponds to sentiments or what goes or the truth of the age, as it were. Um, so I think that kind of follows from what I was talking earlier about you know an anti metaphysical bias when you stop doing metaphysics and and then then what do you have to rely on other than sentiment and, or and consensus? Like, that, that, that I think just follows. So yeah, I don't dispute Pashendi on that ground, but I, I will say this much. I, I think that uh, that's true. Whatever the Pope says, the Pope can be an error. The only place where, well, at least I would argue he can't be an error is where he binds the church. So if he does bind the, ch so he can't bind us if, he can't bind us, uh, if he's speaking as an equal, so let's say when the Pope is preaching a sermon, something like that, he's speaking as a, a preacher or a priest, which is something any bishop or priest has the faculty to do. They're equals in that sense. But when the Pope writes like a moda proprio, well, not every bishop can write a moda proprio. So that, that's a bit different. Uh, I would point, so, uh, the, bish so the Pope can't bind, e so Popes, uh, because they... Uh, 
they are greater than the rest of the church. Uh, they can bind the rest of the church, but popes cannot bind other popes because an equal, according to Cajetan, cannot bind an equal. Mm -hmm. um, so that so that's so that's an important thing that we have to uh, keep in mind. As to the death penalty one, I'd I'd love to you know be here to talk about that some other yeah. time because I have a particular scotistic reading on on that. I think that uh, the Pope. Uh, does have the power to do that, and I think that the justification is actually something that is developing along the lines of what JP2 is teaching. Um, but I think that's just putting to rest a particular Thomistic argument against the death penalty, mm -hmm. uh, for the death penalty. Yeah. I actually think in line with SCOTUS, the reason the death penalty is allowed it doesn't have to do with something about the person, but rather because God per because life is for God to give and take, God permits legislators to do so. And because he yeah. permits legislators to do so, uh, whatever is permitted in scripture uh, can be permitted by the legislator. Yeah. So uh, that's a, but that's a, a particular uh, a voluntarist reading of it. And yeah, I won't touch on that too much, but uh, you want to get to uh, article one. Yeah. So, so article one, for those who aren't familiar with it, um let me see can i can i put can i put article one up uh sure i could also read article one if you like um hmm that's it i wish i could put it on the screen wait can i do this uh wait so oh. there we go ah i can do this i can comment and show my own comment mm, all right i'm that, here for that you it you can yeah yeah all right so Article one: The liturgical books promulgated by Saint Paul the Sixth and Saint John the Paul, John Paul the Second, in conformity with the decrees of Vatican Council II, are the only expression of the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite. Um, from the official translation, it says are the unique expression of the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite or unica, but um, unica uh, means only. Uh, unica means unique. Uh, from uh, from what I understand, unless unique and and uh, let's see so yeah yeah so i i wanted to like do this right out the gate yeah. just because i there some people make a whole thing so mm -hmm. in the official translation it says unique which is a nice um it's a nice cognate in english right which mm -hmm. is why I, I understand why they did it um for those who care about the official well now there's finally a latin text which i was shocked that they finally I actually got a latin text for this uh, the Latin text is here. So you see that you, um, towards the end, unica expressio legi sorandi ritus romani sunt, um, is the unica expression. Uh, unica, at least if you go to, I think every Latin dictionary I've looked at, and say, mm -hmm. and also like I, I can read Spanish, and um, in Spanish, unica means one or only, mm -hmm. right? Like it's the one only. Like, I, I don't know, when people start making things of it, I'm like, is, it, is the Italian really that different from the Spanish? And then with the Latin, it's very clear, right? So, for example, Lewis and Short's Latin dictionary uh, gives the definition of unicus as lone and no more, only, sole, single class. Mm -hmm. And I think we're actually really used to that, right? So, like, for example, in the Apostles' Creed, what do we say? Et in Jesum Christum filium eius unicum. Yeah, yeah. the one yeah. on the Catholic Church. Right. Well, in in yeah, one Catholic Church, and also yeah. in, in Jesus Christ, His only Son. Only right. And yeah. I. So, so I'm. Just, uh, so when it comes to this issue, right, people make a thing of like, well, it says unique, not only. I'm like, well, whatever you say about the Lex Orandi here, or the expression of the Lex Orandi, you have to say about Jesus Christ in relation to the Father as the Son. Okay. Because Fair if, enough. because if this means there can be more than one Lex Orandi. Or more and more, um, more than one expression of Alexandri, then there are more sons of God. Yeah. All right. No. Okay. Fair enough. I'll yeah. I'll grant that only is a is a, an appropriate expression most, and I'm saying that as someone who doesn't speak Latin or has not doesn't have really a background in Latin. So I'm not going to argue that with you because yeah. uh, that's that's not really something I have a background to argue with you in. But I but mm. I don't think I really. But I think I can still take that on board and. I think my reading would be a fair one. So yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I, I and I think that's where our reading, like the argument, should happen because I think like as little quibbling about ambiguity as possible. Yeah. Right? So so I I, I want to ask you, what is when it what is the Lex Orandi, 
And what is Traditionis Custodis doing in this article? Okay, so Lex Orandi, and this, this is the law of what is prayed for, and this goes to the law of what is prayed for is the law of what is believed. Now, and of course, we have this expression in the Catholic Church, and this goes back to, I'm trying to remember his name, he's the disciple of St. Augustine. Um, uh, you, um, you, you wouldn't happen to know it, would you? Uh, uh, yes, it's... Um... Where it's the origin? Uh, oh, Prosper of Aquitaine. Prosper of Aquitaine. Saint Prosper. Yes, thank you. So Saint Prosper of Aquitaine. Uh, I believe he was the one who uh, formulated it, and it's and of course it's something all Catholics are bound to because it's been accepted by the whole Church, and the whole Church, when it accepts something, cannot err. So the Lex Orandi is uh, the Lex Credendi. The law of what is uh, prayed for is the law of what is believed, and this is my understanding. So. Um, Pope Francis is authorizing bishops to change the... So, uh, Pope Francis is authorizing the bishops of the church to change an expression. Note, I say expression of the Lexerani of the church. He's providing them, he's uh, the custodians of tradition, uh, this power. My reading is that Pope Francis is admitting to the bishops the uh, on condition of, of their will to permit an obsolete expression of the Lexerani. The reason is it is no longer the reason is that it is no longer the extraordinary form is not that it cannot express the lex orandi but because pope francis established that the holy see will delegate this matter to the bishops so that's my reading now this is also why uh the article one is proper in this case because what the holy see establishes for all people um unconditionally and it's not something and, of course, a bishop can't come in and say, well, yeah, the Holy See permitted this, but I'm not going to allow it. Uh, the Holy See is final. That's what makes this the unique expression uh, going in. Now, I understand from your article that Pope Francis isn't, change, isn't trying to change a law here, or uh, at least that's how I read you. Would that be a fair way of assessing your objection to this? Um, he is trying to change law, right? He is yeah, he, um Right, the goal of it is a full abrogation of traditions of a, of a of the traditional Roman right. Uh, though I will say he's not um, he's not abrogating, in the strict sense, the traditional Roman liturgy. Yes. Because, yeah, and, and because it is permitted. Yeah. So, and this is actually something else we should get into. What exactly is the Roman right here? Yeah. So the Roman right is um, it started with uh, Pope uh, Gregory the Great, and then it actually went through a few reforms. First in the 12th century, then again with Pius V in, um, in, uh, with the TLM, with the Council of Trent. And he himself even abrogated other uses that weren't in conformity with his missile if they were older than, what, 200 years? And after... And after and of course, these expressions of the Roman Rite were, were gone because uh, uh, at the time of the Reformation, the understanding was that the Protestants wanted to appropriate for the presbyters or the bishops, uh, or their bishops, uh, the, uh, the ability over the Mass. And of course, that's not true. That belongs expressly to the Holy See. And that's why if you read his Missal, when he says no uh, or the Council of Trent, where it says no presbyter can make these changes, it's in reference to the presbyters. It's not in reference to the Holy See itself when it acts uh, with the power of the Pope. So uh, this is where it gets to the distinction between the sacraments and the sacramentals. So a sacrament is like the Mass. The Mass is a sacrament. If any bishop was or priest was to say, um, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, basically say the words of institution with the proper matter and uh, they had the right orders and the right intent that is validly going to be a sacrament it's not licit you can't have it necessarily but it is valid and if and what and the right of it though the surrounding context um so for example the surrounding prayers the formulation that stuff that can act and has been abrogated um and that's changed in, and that has changed before. Um, so, 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 what I'm wondering, right? So, the Lex Orandi is the law of prayer, right? right. So, 
right? And the expression of it, right? So the expression of the Lexarandi is the specific liturgy, right? Right. So you, you would, you, is that your understanding on that? The specific use of, yeah, a specific use of the liturgy that's, uh, the specific use or formulation of that liturgy. So um, I'll just read something from Father Charles Augustine. He says, the Council of Trent has not defined this power directly, but only negatively, and it and determined that the rights accompanying the administration of the sacraments may not be arbitrarily condemned, omitted, or changed. Our texts claim the exclusive power of instituting sacraments for the Holy See. This is not surprising mm -hmm. if we remember the general saying, Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi. The sacraments are the living expression of the faith and hope that is the church. Sorry, the sacramentals are the ex living expression of the faith, hope, are the sacramentals are the living expression of the faith and hope in the church so when so it, he's not so he says that the sacramentals can have this power to be omitted changed or abrogated but it's exclusive to the holy see but at the same time they are expressions they so, so i read the sacramentals as being the expressions and the and i think the expressions can change depending on the holy see's legislation thereof Okay, so so you're talking about the liturgy as a sacramental. Uh, I'm speaking about the Roman rite as a sacramental. Yes. Well, so it says that the that the liturgical books promulgated by Paul VI and John Paul II are the only expression, right? Mm -hmm. So the expression is the Novus Ordo Messe. Yeah. So are you calling the Novus Ordo Messe a sacramental? Yes. Okay, so. What I'm wondering then is the the traditional Roman liturgy is celebrated, mm -hmm. right? So uh, being an expression doesn't mean it's a permitted celebration. Because, uh, per precisely, because, right? So how? So what does it mean then for it something to be the expression of the law of prayer, right? So it's per. Right, so the law of prayer has to be per something that is permitted. So a valid, so sorry, a sound expression has to be something that it is permitted by the Holy See, and for it to be the Rome, the unique Roman rite, it has to be something accepted by the Roman Church. Now, it's not just what's accepted, right? Because there are other because the traditional Roman liturgy is permitted to be celebrated, yet it's not the expression it's not part of the expression of the lex Arandi. it's oh so, it, it's, what, per it, it's right. permitted but it's it, it's permitted right but it's not the, the expression so what make what does it mean for something to be the expression of the right. Rondi? it's not the unique expression it's unique sorry it's not the unique or the only express so sorry it is the uh, just need to gather my thoughts here so if the uh church if it is something that is expressed, then it is something that is um, expressed by the church and with permission of the church. But the reason why the prayer books of Pope Paul VI and Pope John Paul II are the unique expression is because they are the ones that are bound to as um, as the uh, as the one uh, given to all priests and bishops, they are they are basically the uh, the the standard, and they are something that don't require any approval from any intermediaries. Whereas the traditional Latin mass does require that from the custodians of the tradition, that is the bishops. The bishops actually have a right to uh, not permit it and render it uh, well, to be uh, to be. Uh, unlawful whereas but, the uh, novus ordo doesn't have that only the va the uh, holy see did not delegate that power to anyone else uh, they permit anyone to say it yeah and, and and i guess here right it's not about permission because literally nothing else can be said to ha be the the ex an expression of the lex Arandi, the roman right except the novus ordo right nothing else can claim that title claim canonical status to doctrinal level right nothing else only the Novus Ordo Misse so the issue I guess I would have here mm -hmm. is that what the Lex Arandi is the Lex Arandi isn't um itself right is simply uh, I, I almost like to call it like the canon of prayer it's kind of like the canon of scripture right individual bibles are expressions of the canon of scripture 
but the canon ideally never changes, right? If you believe this is the canon, then this is the canon. And with the Lekarandi, that never changes. Only the expressions change. Because, uh, and, and at least that's in the theology, in Roman theology, that's all I found as the, like, because it's interesting. There's not a lot of work, but there is a, a steady Jesuit stream of work on the Lexarandi in the early to mid 20th century, which is kind of cool. So the problem is if it's not about permission, because it can't be about permission because things that are permitted are not the expression. Then you have the issue is the, the canon of prayer is no is not expressed by the, the traditional Roman liturgy anymore even though it's permitted. And if, if, and if that does not express the law of prayer, it does not express the law of belief. And I think this gets to then the reason why Pope Francis legislated it, right? And what, why is it that the traditional, Latin, uh, the traditional Roman liturgy needs to be abrogated or you need to go through this process of slowly getting rid of it over time to the point where it will be completely abrogated, which is his stated purpose. And his state of purpose is Vatican II. Right. Because so, the doctrines of Vatican II are not compatible with the traditional mm -hmm. Roman liturgy. And that's why I say this is just mod this is just another example of modernism, which isn't surprising, right? Pope Francis is Pope Francis. He's a he's a liberal he's a liberal Jesuit. And that's not He's not a Jesuit. He's not a Jesuit. Well, I, I mean in background, right? I mean in background. His background is as a oh, Jesuit. Oh, is he a Jesuit? I, I'm... He, he was the um he was like the administrator of the order. Oh right. Yeah, sorry. I completely forgot. Sorry. Yeah. I I don't remember his I unlike sorry, I didn't I don't remember a lot of his Bergoglio period. Yeah, and, and I, I think it's important. I think like understanding Francis Bergoglio, obviously I'm not saying that Bergoglian acts are papal acts. But what I am saying is that these are like when Pope Francis speaks, he's speaking as a human being, as a man who is Bergoglio and Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. uh, unless, well, like, you know, despite what Nova Sorda Watch would like us to believe, and it's you need to you need to understand that he's he's a uh, he's a liberal Latin American Jesuit who is the provincial su superior of the Jesuits in the seventies, mm -hmm. and his writing here about how now certain expressions of prayer and belief are incompatible after the council. Well, that sounds like normal theologians who say that the theology of the Roman church changes over time to accommodate with the times, well, especially with theolo Jesuit mm -hmm. theologians who have talked, who have written about the Lex mm -hmm. Well, All right. So that was a lot, uh, but I'll go over a few things. One, uh, it is an expression. It is an expression of the lexerandi, like uh, the traditional Roman rite is an expression of the lexerandi, but it is no longer the Roman rite at this point. It's an obsolete mode of it. Um, so, he, just to use maybe a bit of an analogy, uh, you remember those old telephones, the ones that had a spin dial. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's a telephone, but. Most people don't have those. In fact, most people don't even have home phones. They usually use something, at least in my area, most people now use cell phones. So, at the, so the traditional Roman rite isn't, is no longer the Roman rite anymore, uh, not because it wasn't once um, held as such or wasn't once considered as such, but now it isn't because in order to properly be called a Roman rite, it has to be something by which all members of of the Roman Church, all that is, all clergy can celebrate, and without that necessary quality, because it has been abrogated, it can no longer even be its extraordinary form because it is not something up to uh, the up to the individual priest. It is now something that it is up to the bishop to do so. In terms of the whole Vatican uh, II point, um, Vatican II was. Yeah, it did teach doctrine and dogma. I'm not going to say it didn't. But if you look at its writing on the on the liturgy, like the reason why um, the Nuvis Ordo is in conformity with Vatican II is because the council in its uh, teachings on the liturgy were meant to establish a new liturgy would be coming up afterwards. That's what's in conformity. Um, it's in conformity with its uh, mission. It's not necessarily... 
uh, that's what uh, the Nuvus Ordo is in conformity with, which the, and not the traditional Latin rite. Whereas beforehand, the traditional Latin rite was uh, uh, was something which, sorry, whereas uh, we could say that there is nothing in the Second Vatican Council that contradicts the, the TLM, but the TLM is something which uh, the Second Vatican Council uh, sought to reform and sought to change, specifically because there are new practical reasons uh, why some why some of its features were untenable, and of course we all and of course just because someone uh, says uh, a particular expression is no longer uh, practical doesn't mean it no longer expressed the law of prayer and hence the law of belief. It's just it's not practical to the uh, to the um, uh, to the laity at that point, and that's something decided fairly by the bishops. So my concern is simply that that's not what Article 1 says. Mm -hmm. Literally no thing at all can claim to be an expression of the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite except the Novus Ordo Missae. Like, it's pretty definitive. And this isn't a... So we've seen two things. One, only the Novus Ordo Missae is the expression of... can be said to be the expression of the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite, and that this is doctrinal. Because if it's juridical then the traditional Roman liturgy would be abrogated. And while that's the reason why this doctrinal claim is made, right? So uh, Pope Francis, in his accompanying letter uh, for Traditionis Custodis, he writes to the bishop and says, um, let's see... He writes, it, uh, it is up to you to proceed in such a way as to return to a unitary form of celebration and to determine case by case the reality of the groups which celebrate this, that is the 1962, the traditional Roman liturgy, the, uh, this Missale Romanum. And so, and so, so that's the really goal. Mm -hmm. But when you say that something is not an ex does not express the Lex Orandi, that means... Of the Roman rite. Of the Roman rite, right? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know any other right it's, it expresses. The traditional Roman liturgy isn't, does it, is it an expression in the Syro um, Malabar, right? I don't think it is, right? There's it's only an expression. It So the tradition, so the TLM was an expression of the Roman rite up into, and the reason it was an expression, at least thanks to um, the legislative work of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth was because he he uh, in his decree made uh, decreed it to be the extraordinary form and the reason why some it can be said to be the roman rite in that sense is because it is something that anyone who is um, a priest in the latin rite can do it you don't require the permission of Where do you get that interpretation hmm. well um Let's see. Let's see. So I'm just going to need to. Let's see. So, all right. Uh, let's see. For, so I. Hmm. My, my only concern let's, let's is we really need to understand what the Lex Orandi means and what it means to be an expression. And yeah. I, I don't, I, I've like never heard like a theologian or even the magisterium kind of explain it like you do. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering where you're grounding this, like these, de because you're using these definitions that aren't in use. Well, uh, let's see. Well, who established? Well, first off, the question is who establishes what the Roman rite is. Well, that's not the question, right? The Roman rite is a juridical is a um, is a juridical reality, right? So, the Roman rite is uh, is the rite which contains the Roman Church, which has a single a singular expression of its lex orandi. Now, every, every right has an expression of its lex orandi, right? Yes. 
it's in the Sarah Malabar liturgy, its particular liturgy, which is derived from the liturgy of Saint Sadai and Mari, that's their expression of the Lex Orandi, right? Mm. Um, the Lex Orandi is unchanging, right? Okay. It, uh, so, for example, Father George Terrell, who I, 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 and I go to Father George Terrell because he's like this Nouvelle Theology Jesuit, well received in America, very influential, the, influential in theology mm -hmm. on Alex Arandi, and he's all, also like almost like the only one who does it, who works on it. Okay. Um, and I have a feeling this is influencing uh, Francis's thought, or, well, it influenced him back when he was Bergoglio, right? He says about the Lex Arandi, the maxim that is Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, has reference to the prayer and belief of the universal church of the whole body of the faithful in which the life of Christ is continued and whose members collectively, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of charity is spread abroad, right? So the prayer and belief of the universal church in its substance is unchanging uh, because right. we would believe that belief doesn't- no, well, we Belief doesn't change. Right, just in the same way, the prayer doesn't change. Mm -hmm. The expressions of, so do we call it, if you want to be fancy, like a, the primordial prayer, that um, the expressions change. Okay. So, what you have in some more in um, interesting Custodes is saying, well, the traditional Roman liturgy did express the Lex Orandi in the Roman Rite, but it no longer does. And what's the reason for that? Well, the reason for it is the Second Vatican Council. He explicitly says in his letter to the bishops, seminarians and new priests should be formed in the faithful observance of the prescriptions of the missal and liturgical books in which is reflected the liturgical reform willed by Vatican Council too. So it's not that there's a new liturgy, or and it's not a juridical change because he doesn't fully abrogate it. It's that the Lex Arandi, the expression of the Lex Arandi is no longer compatible with the church after the Second yeah. Vatican Council, which isn't a radical claim, right? So, uh, so that, I, I just want to... Like, he's speaking a lot like the theologians mm -hmm. of his time. I'm not surprised. All right, right? So, so, all right, so I just have two clarifying points to ask you. Uh, the first one is you said it was a juridical reality. Doesn't that follow that uh, what the Roman Rite is would be something for the juridical body of the Roman Church to decide? I'm, I'm saying that the Roman Rite is a juridical reality in which um, in which that doctrinal things happen. Right, but would you also not say that liturgical things happen there too? Yeah. Okay, and you would agree that both the TLM and the Nuvus Ordo are, lit are liturgies that were uh, uh, that were themselves expressed at one point or another by the Roman Church. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what and what those consisted of was determined by the body, the legislative body. Uh, yeah. That is, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, I don't see how or why a legislative body could not decide that what would be considered the Roman Rite at one point would not be considered the Roman Rite at another point. So, so that this is the issue. Yeah. That's not what this is saying. It's right. not determining what the Roman Rite is. To change what the Roman Rite is would be like extend the Roman Rite into India, right? Which and I, I don't think, technically speaking, the Diocese of Rome extends that far. Well, and the Roman Rite extends that far. Well, I mean, you have, well, I mean, you have Latin churches there. But, uh, oh, oh, whatever. But yeah, so it's, it's so like uh, the Roman right is simply the um, it is simply the fact that the Church of Rome has extended its diocese and its jurisdiction over a large area. And I'm not talking about like universal jurisdiction of like mm -hmm. the Pope. I'm saying like the expression, uh, the um, the way liturgy and the canon law and how bishops, all that, right? That's all part of the Roman right, which is grounded in physical in physical borders. The but that's not it's not changing the Roman right, right? It's not expanding its borders. It's not changing its canon law. It's not juridical. It's not the juridical stuff that's changing. What's changing? It's saying that the traditional Roman liturgy is no longer because of Vatican II an expression of the Lex Orandi. And I don't know how you avoid it. It's, I, I'm not sure how you're getting that. I'm not sure how you're getting the 
the uh, traditional, the extraordinary form, what well, was the ex the extraordinary form, or the mass promulgated after uh, Trent's is not in conformity with the decrees of Vatican II. It's only saying that the Novus Ordo is in conformity with the decrees of Vatican II. It doesn't exclude, it doesn't say only what you're saying. excludes literally everything else. I'm sorry? The word only. Lich, like the very definition of unica means lone without any other. That's literally what the word means. So when you say it's the only expression, you're saying literally nothing else is. And what Benedict said in Sworn Pontificum is that the traditional Roman liturgy and the Novus Ordo are both expressions. So Benedict says they're both expressions of the of the Lux Orandi of the Roman Rite. Francis says only exclusively no other but the Novus Ordo Misse is the expression of the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite. He's not changing the Roman Rite. He's changing the, ex he's making a doctoral claim about whether the traditional Roman liturgy expresses the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite. So when it says in conformity with the decrees of Vatican II, I'm, I'm only reading that it was supposed to be the successor, N not that it's, and it was supposed to, because that's what the decrees of Vatican II in its doctrine on the liturgy uh, well, were did, paving the way for. Say, not, not that, and that's a disciplinary matter. It's not a matter of saying that um, it, the traditional Latin Mass contradicts any, any uh, dogmatic teaching in the Second Vatican Council. But he, he doesn't refer, strictly speaking, to the canons or the doctrines or the decrees. It's actually kind of cool. In his letter to the bishops, he says that uh, that they need to abandon the traditional Roman liturgy and embrace the Novus Ordo because it's only the Novus Ordo which is ref uh, in which in which is reflected the liturgical reform willed by Vatican Council too. The, yeah. Well, the, all the, now the, no canon created the Novus Ordo Missae, right? Nothing, nothing in the in the Second Vatican Council actually constructed what the Novus Ordo, Novus Ordo Missae was. In in certain parts, the Novus Ordo Missae contradicts the Council, though we can discuss that later. Yeah, if that's, I, I don't know if that's controversial or not, but so that he's not saying like this canon, right? He's saying what many of the theologians of his time said and still say that the Second Vatican Council led the church to a new realization of its doctrines, which is incompatible with what was there before. And they said the same thing about the liturgy. And here's the point. If the express, if, if you're saying the traditional Roman liturgy can no longer accurately express the Lex Orandi, which is unchanging, then you have well we would say it's unchanging then you have to say the lex orandi can change which is what all the which is what the um new Val theology and modernists were saying is that because of the times the lex orandi needs to change and that also means the lex credendi needs to change so it's not that radical and i don't know how you avoid that because this isn't a juridical thing lex orandi isn't a juridical category the exper i agree lex orandi isn't a juridical category the expression of the Lex Orandi is, however, a juridical matter, and what that... Where do you get that? I, I'm really... I, I li okay, because in my uh, because in my quote of Charles uh, Father Charles Augustine, he literally... Augustus, he's, he, ma he makes it clear that this is a sacramental, and as a sacramental, it is to the Holy See's power to uh, abrogate, change, condemn it is within its competence to do so. That is what it's for. In fact, even Pope Pius IV uh, abrogated different uh, abrogated different expressions of the Roman but, Missal. But did, they, but did they say that's what, it, did they, what I'm worried about is you're mm. saying the Pope has the authority to change the, litur the, the liturgical expression. Yes. Or, or the juridical liturgy of a church. But that's not the issue, I okay. don't think. You're right. saying when they're doing that, they mean this. That's the juncture that I'm not seeing. Because when you say something does not express the Lex Orandi, because I've read Quo Primo, and it has been a long time, so maybe I'm wrong, 
but he did not use this language. He did not say that only um, my missile and any missile within two, with 200 years of antiquity are expressions of the Lex Arandi of the Roman right. He doesn't do that because that's not what, what an expression of the Lex Arandi is or means. And in your quote, at least from what I remember, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, mm -hmm. he wasn't talking, he didn't even use the phrase Lex Arandi, which has a very technical... He, he, did, use the, he did use the phrase Lex Arandi. Okay, can you say it again? The Council of Trent has not defined this power, but only negatively determined that rights accompanying the administration of the sacraments may not be arbitrarily condemned, omitted, or changed. Our text claims the exclusive power of instituting sacramentals, and that includes rights, mm -hmm. as, uh, are instituting sacramentals for the Holy See. So the Holy See has this power. This is not surprising if we remember the general saying, Lex Arundi, Lex Credundi. The sacramentals are the living expression of the faith and hope that is the church. So the sacramentals, and since both the Novus Ordo and the TLM are sacramentals, it is open to the Holy See to omit them. And Lex Arundi was included in that quote. So it's saying Lex Arundi, Lex Credundi, right? It's using that. But when it talks about the change, of the liturgy, it doesn't say that the expressions, well, it's difficult in two respects. One, we need to remember the traditional Roman liturgy isn't abrogated. It is still a juridical structure in the Roman rite, right? It's still a thing that's tolerated. It's not forbidden yet. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis said it will be forbidden. He's expressly said that um, the point of his, of his uh, apostolic letter is to eventually abrogate completely okay but um at least in his letter to the bishops he's very and clear. it's within his and if he wanted to for and i would even say if he wanted to forbid the whole thing at that point it would have been within his competence yeah right so he has he like he's literally the pope he yeah. can have whatever liturgy he wants he could have the 1662 book of common prayer right he's the pope so the the issue isn't that right because everyone agrees that liturgies can change What's, it, what's saying here is that the that liturgy, which is being used and is not abrogated, hmm. does not express the um, the lex orandi of the Roman rite. That's the problem. It's be, it's saying, uh, whereas the Benedict the Sixteenth, who wanted to keep continuity, he develops this. He's saying, well, the ordinary expression is the Novus Ordo Misse, the extraordinary expression of the same Lex Arandi, right, to get rid of that, uh, to, to avoid any discontinuity is the traditional Roman liturgy. And these two expressions of the church's Lex Arandi will in no way lead to a division, the church's Lex Credendi, for they are two usages of the one Roman rite. And that's what's directly contradicted by Francis. He says, no, the Traditional Roman liturgy cannot claim to express the Lex Orandi. If that's true and it's not abrogated, which means it's not a liturgical issue he's talking about, you have to say that we have a different Lex Orandi and therefore a different Lex Credendi, which makes sense based on how he talks because he's speaking just like all his comment, like theologians like him, which say that the doctrine, that the doctrine and the prayer have to change with the council. All right. Well, uh, let's start off with uh, with the fact that both these quotations are each in the first article of the respective moda proprio. They're both view. It's I think it's fairly clear that Pope Francis is viewing this as a legislative matter, considering he thinks that whatever the extraordinary form of the mass is, it can be something which can be. Um, it can be something which can be overturned, and it is within his competency as the Pope to do so, because, as Cogitin would say, equals cannot bind one another. And if Pope Fr and if that's the case, then Pope Francis is free to do so. And now does, both and both does he say that Article One is merely merely disciplinary and not doctrinal. Uh, the fact. Well, the fact that he's issuing it in the context of a moda proprio, which is a legal document, uh, now granted, it doesn't mean he's not teaching there, but it does. But at the very least, it does mean that it does have, uh, it does have a legislative role primarily. And secondly, it's odd to think that Pope Francis would be um, 
per, would be permitting something which goes against a, an ecumenical council within his own church. I think that interpretation is a lot harder to square. Um, I'm not sure. How, uh, I'm not sure how Francis would hold both of these ideas in his head. I think the more charitable read is he's just overturning something he thinks is in the competency of the Pope to overturn. And in terms of what the whole mission of the Second Vatican Council was, yes, it was to teach dogma, but it also was to pave the way for a new mass and a new liturgy. This is why we saw, uh, this is uh, this is how I would read its doctrine on the liturgy, this, it's, um, constitution on the liturgy anyway. So I think that's what's being taught in conformity. The reason why it the traditional Latin Mass isn't, or uh, the extraordinary form as it was under Benedict, isn't under conformity is because that was the very thing that the constitution of the liturgy was making way to change. So I, I think when you read in conjunction, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, in uh, uh, in conformity with the decrees of the Vatican Council, I read it as in in the decrees of its liturgical of its uh, liturgical constitution, not in the decrees of you know just its theological teaching. Um. So so I guess two things. One, uh, apostolic letters do often teach. Mm. Right? And this is an apostolic letter. It's also a mode of proprio because yeah, it, 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 it obviously there are definitely a lot of canon law stuff changing. But you, it's is at least I'm trying to think, but it's not unusual for especially when there's a lot of uh, juris uh, legal change to start with the doctrinal reason. That's not crazy to think about, and it's not terribly uncommon. Right, you establish. That's why it's Article One. This is the doctrinal reason. This is the law, and it would be odd to say that when he uses a doctrinal category, he's, uh, which I, I think that's pretty clear. Right, the issue of the lex and if something can express the lex is something that's debated by theologians. That's proper to the liturgical theology. That's not a, a canon. Canon lawyers don't talk. At least maybe they do, but. That's not like a predominantly canon law thing. So he's using doctrinal language to preface his legal um, his legal changes, which isn't, I don't know, that doesn't seem very unusual to me. That actually seems pretty par for the course. And I think that's the issue is, uh, yeah. what I'm saying is the reason that he's he's saying that only the Novus Ordo Misse is the, it can be, can uh, be said to express the Lex Arandi. Well, if something cannot express the Lex Arandi, then it cannot express the Lex Credendi. I, you, you have to, because of the maximum, you have to be able to say that. that yeah, I, I would agree with that. But in order to exp but the re I would definitely agree with that. Now, how, what does it require, at least in Catholic thought, to, to express the Lex Crindundi, or, sorry, the Lex Arundi? It requires also that the uh, expression in question is, um, a, is a licit one. That is, it is properly uh, approved of by the Holy See. And if you're doing something which is illicit, well, you're not expressing the faith, because the faith also comes in tandem with obedience. And and that I that's not what he's saying, right? So, for example, uh, um, it, that's what. So you would. So if somebody was to uh, celebrate an illicit mass, uh, would you say that they are expressing the lex orandi? They could, yeah. So you could celebrate an illicit mass and still um, keep in yeah. keep with the law of prayer. Because the law of prayer is expressed by the liturgy, not by the person of the minister, right? Liturgies express the lex orandi. So I would argue, a a episcop uh, like a, a a a priest who's been suspended in the Angl in an Anglican church, but celebrates the 1928 Book of Common Prayer expresses the lex orandi 
of the Ecclesia Anglicana. So um, here's a he's okay. sitting and doing that. Yeah, it's a sinful like it's a sinful liturgy because you shouldn't be celebrating mass without your bishop. But it, at least in the way that Terrell talks about the Luxorandi and how it's used historically, it's not the sin of the expression isn't the issue. But that's not even the issue here. What Francis is saying is, I will tolerate its use, which actually is a pretty just normal natural law thing. I think that's the most traditional and conservative thing about Francis, that when you need to correct an error in a society, you don't just flat out destroy all of it, right? Mm -hmm. You slowly, over time, get it out of the society. That's a, just a good natural law principle, no matter whether it's the society of the church or the society of the state. So I'm actually not surprised that he's slowly over time saying, hey, here's where we're going, but I mm -hmm. know it wouldn't be prudent to just get mm -hmm. there immediately so that's all that's also that's actually very traditional about him but the issue it, but, it, it, but that would mm -hmm. but in this case it would mean that he would permit people to express unbelief because if you were not expressing uh the law of prayer then yeah, you are already, in his view he's tolerating a something that do, in his words so, does not express the lex serandi or the lex credenti but the reason for it is saying, hey, there's been all this this bad stuff. There's been this defiance to the changes of the council. Therefore, we need to get get away from that. Yeah, That's the same as any society that's trying to get its citizens away from idolatry. Sometimes you can just smash the idols. That's nice when you can and forbid all the festivals. But any good king knows if you need to get your citizens away from idolatry, you wean them off and mm. you tolerate evil. Right. That's I don't see why that's a controversial idea for anything. And now Francis may be wrong about wanting his, the goal he's trying to go to, but his method is a very good con natural law method. But that's not what he's doing. Well, so that's what he's doing. The issue is he's saying not just like these illicit celebrations are are not the Lex Rondi or expressions of the Lex Rondi. He's saying, for example, in, in St. Francis de Sales in Atlanta, Georgia. There is express Episcopal and Papal permission to celebrate the traditional Roman liturgy. He is saying that licit liturgy does not express the Roman rite, um, and the only way to get away from that conclusion is to torture his words. Right? You have to torture the meaning of only. All right. So a couple of things. The first is I'm still really hesitant to accept the idea that something. Uh, illicit can necessarily express the law of the the law of prayer and thus the law of belief. Well, if, he, he, does, he says it doesn't. He says the church Roman. No, no, no. But but do you? Uh, oh, oh so, but you're saying what I said about. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. Yeah. So the let. All right. Yeah. That. Yeah. So would uh, you say, for example, a priest who celebrates a satanic mass, but you know, says the words of consecration validly, is he expressing both the lex orandi and the lex credandi? Um, I would need to look at the rubrics, I guess. Right. <laughs> he, um, I mean, he says the words of institution. That's what I'm saying. Is you need to accept it as a whole, right? Because the minister isn't part of the liturgy. Right. But, but the, the, the right. I, I've never seen in theology, though, to mm -hmm. be fair, I'm not an expert in Lexerandi studies. Okay. Right? Neither am I. I but think this is just I, you guys I, talking it out. Yeah. Right. But I would like to show, someone to show me where any theologian says the priest is part of the expression of the Lexerandi. Now, of course, Francis doesn't believe any traditional mm -hmm. Roman liturgy expresses the Lexerandi, whether it's licit or illicit. Right. He doesn't believe it expresses it at all. He doesn't believe that you can actually get to the lex credenti of the of the church after Vatican II through the Roman the church Roman liturgy. That's Article One. But um, in regards to a disobedient priest celebrating a mass, so he would say, well, I don't know what Francis would say in this respect. I would say that the a priest celebrating a Novus Ordo Missae illicitly is expressing the lex orandi of the Roman rite. All right, so. In Article Two, it does seem all right. So, um, so in the prelude before the Articles, he says that he has considered appropriate to establish the following Articles, and then he goes on to Article One. So this is an article that is established at this point. It is not something that he says has always been taught. It's not even something he says it's uh, it's doctrine. He doesn't say this has always been the case. He's saying he's establishing it. This is. 
if something is being established, I think these articles are a matter of law. That's what it. Where, where, so can you? Have, uh, therefore, you... I have considered it appropriate to establish the following. No, 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 but where, where do you get the idea that 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 means that like that that word is uniquely juridical? It's where do you get that from? What does the word establish mean? Um, well, the cherno means to decide or to settle or to pronounce a decision or to judge or declare or to judge. So you can decree something. Are all the papal decretals of uh, doctrines no longer doctrines? Uh, fair enough. And but, uh, okay, so that's no. You're right. You're right. So. You're, oh, hold on. Oh, you're right about that. But also considering consider the whole paragraph. At this time, having considered the wishes expressed by the Episcopate and having heard the opinion of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, I now desire with this apostolic letter to press even to press ever more in the constant search for ecclesial communion. Therefore, I have considered it appropriate to establish the following. So these articles are a means to something. As you said, it was to push out these, um, you know, uh, disobedient people within traditional circles. Uh, that's the ultimate goal. And, of course, he's heard the various opinions of the CDC and of the Episcopate. And he then goes and then every other article is just a matter of legislation. Um, so, so, so the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, does that deal with doctrinal matters primarily or disciplinary matters primarily? It deals with both. It deals with both, but what does it... If, there, if you have a liturgical abuse, uh, I don't know, Faith Community of St. Sabina, right? Yeah. It's, if, if Cardinal Supich was ever to take that ser seriously and he needed to consult at someone in the Curia, who would he go to for... Um, for jazz music and mass. Would he go to the CDF or would he go to the CDW? Yeah, he would go to uh, the Congregation of Worship. Yeah, right. Um, the CDF, as the name implies, is the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, soon to be the Dicastery of the Doctrine of the Faith, however, most greatly known as the Holy Inqu the Office of the Holy Inquisition. Yeah, but... Uh Right. So he's who is he dealing with? Also, he's dealing with people who are harboring anti uh, Catholic opinion within traditional circles, namely uh, people who uh, love the traditional the uh, the Trinitine mass to such an extent that they would either, uh, you know, revert to a sort of Gallican crypto Gallicanism. Um, yeah, basically. I'm, I'm well, I, I, don't, I don't think I think Lefebvism is is not it's not condemned by rome in, in a like it's not a, it's it does not contradict any dogma he was right? ex he was excommunicated uh no, no, and no, no, no. not for heresy i grant that but so that's well, the first he, thing the second thing is the really. second the, the second thing is the favorism uh i'm pretty favorism yeah. does pretty much push for a whole gallicanism because it basically says the pope can do things like um, sanction a liturgy that's simultaneously poisonous to the average believer. Um, it's uh, it, it denies that it, he can accept an ecumenical council. Um, is it legitimate opinion in Rome to believe that the Pope can teach error? That's not Lefebvreism, though. Well, it, not yeah. that he can teach error, but he can even bind people to a, to the to an ecumenical council that teaches error. Well, that's not. Obviously, no one, I don't know anyone who argues that there's anything that's like ex cathedra, right? That's infallible, that has requires the assent of faith in the Second Vatican Council. That requ yeah, but that requires severely diminishing the Pope. So, for example, I'm just saying, I'm saying, you may not believe it's correct, but is it a a legitimate opinion? There are no. tons. No, where which which infallible statement uh, forbids the idea that the Pope can err in his teaching? Uh, let's see um, the state. Let's see the teachings of Vatican One. How about? Oh, actually, the the one I would say that I, that Lefebvreists are very terrible at denying 
is uh, the Pope's infallibility over secondary objects of worship. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for example, if you're someone who says that the uh, Novus Ordo Missae is poisonous to the faith and is even detrimental, um, which is something, yes, that I have heard Lefebvre even himself say, then yes, you are directly denying his power over secondary objects of worship. Well, you're just saying... That... In fact, this is even something that uh, Michael Davies had to walk back on. Well... <laughs> So the issue is simply can't like where does it say like where is the infallible statement that because we're not used when you say bind I'm sure you don't mean bind in like the ex cathedra sense like this you, is not infallible do you believe that uh, the pope okay not you but do you believe a Catholic has to hold that uh, the Pope has infallibility over secondary objects of worship um in the say he. The issue is that infallibility is an attempt to bind the uni the church universal and promulgating a Roman liturgy that's not in use in the whole church cannot qualify then. Um, that itself cannot qual get to the level of infallibility, at least according to Vatican I. Now, are, could he, now the Pope has given universal in the full sense, like over every single right, every single church, everywhere in the, in the, what it would call the Church Catholic, but that's not what happened in the Nova Sorto Missae. Well, actually, it, it is. They promulgated it. They approved its usage. And in fact, uh, the secondary objects of worship was the very precedent that was used to bind the whole church to the view that Anglican priests aren't actually priests. Like, that... Uh, that was proprio. It has a huge pedigree. Um, it was where used to that? condemn the view of Jansen. So where is the? I'm wondering though. I'm still looking for that source saying that when the Pope issues a Roman liturgy, it is infallible. Do you believe that? So you don't. Well, here. So but like you believe? So oh, so here. Uh, I'm just going to ask you. It's pre. Fine. It's. Oh, it's just a matter of the ordinary teaching of the magisterium. So you don't, so it doesn't have like this one place where it comes out. You see it play over and over again in church history. So for example, uh, Pope Leo XIII with the Anglican orders, you also, um, also Jansen's work was condemned. Uh, and then when the Jansen has said, okay, the Pope is right when he issues these condemnations, uh, against what he believes Jansen taught, but he didn't properly understand Jansen. The Pope just said, no, I did. It's condemned. Yeah. So, 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 so you're it, saying it's done, right? Therefore, it is dogma, but that's not the qualification for universal ordinary infallibility. And, and that's, I guess, the issue looking at this whole situation. Well, in, well the question looking at it was, are the favorite, are the favorists, is the favorism something which is uh, a a valid opinion for a Catholic to hold, and I said no, and yeah, I, I and the reason why is it denies something which Catholics are bound to believe, namely the Pope has power over secondary objects of worship, and so, the liturgy is not a secondary object of worship, i.e., something we use to worship. Um, then I, I really the don't. The issue know. is you have to say that that's de fide, right? Because opinion about a legitimate opinion is allowed even. It, it, uh, is allowed as long as it doesn't contradict something that's de fide. So even something that's widely accepted, right, is maybe uh, uh, like sense communis or sense certa, but it's not de fide, right? So, like, are you familiar with my concern with the levels of authority? Yeah. About this? Yeah. So, for example, some things are more certain, some things are de fide, some things are dogmatic. There's there is a, a chain or a hierarchy in this. I yeah. don't dis I don't dispute that. My point is, if a pope's if popes condemn something and Catholics are bound to the condemnation of a pope, and the best explanation is secondary objects of worship, then yeah. I mean, even Michael Davies utilizes secondary objects of worship, and when he was uh, writing on why Anglican priests were not priests. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, now. I'm sure now. The reason I'm sending Michael Davies to you is because he's someone you respect. I'm not. Oh, gonna, yeah. yeah. No, I think Davies was was wrong. On, you think he was wrong? Walking back, right? Uh, my issue is simply that it's not. It has not reached the level of de fide that 
um, which is why I view it as this as a legitimate Roman Catholic opinion. Well, uh, that, that hasn't that 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 the, there's nothing in the idea that the Pope can promulgate a an illicit liturgy, right? Or that he can promulgate error. There's nothing that there's nothing de fide that it contradicts. There's something that sends communities it contradicts. There's something sent certa that it contradicts, but it doesn't contradict anything de fide. So by definition, it's a minority tolerated opinion. All right. So here's a, a question that I have for you then. Uh, why can't Pope Francis be wrong or Pope Benedict, maybe he's wrong about what the uh, TLM expresses or whether it's an expression of the Roman writer or not? Because I could just say, well, as a Catholic, you know, it's not like I'm bound to secondary objects of worship or, or anything. Yeah, so yeah. the Pope can err on this. Yeah, Francis, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's like Francis, because he because he's a modernist. Okay. And I'm not using it as an insult because he, he not, and I'm not saying just over this, but because he believes that the Lex Orandi and the Lex Credendi, and, the, by the, and necessarily Lex Credendi, but the Lex Orandi is different after the Second Vatican Council right because of that there needs to be a both a juridical restriction but mm -hmm. not application yet right that's the whole issue that we have here and um he says he he corrects benedict he says benedict is wrong that no there are not two expressions of the lexorandi because the tlm cannot express the lexorandi of the roman right after the Vatican, second vatican council instead only the Novus Ordo Misse expresses the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite. So that's ben that's Francis saying Benedict was wrong, right? And Benedict, the foundation, by the way, for Benedict saying what he said is because the traditional Roman liturgy was never abrogated, right? He didn't think it was abrogated, and whereas Francis very clearly disagrees with that. I so, I, th I think Francis is right on that. It was abrogated. Yeah. So so but what we see is like okay, right? I say like. And this isn't even me per se as an Anglican. It's just as even as a Roman Catholic, it's like well, Fran you know, popes disagree with each other. One of the on, on issues of doctrine, one of them has to be wrong, right? Or I, I don't know. I guess if you're a super modernist in the space of what fifteen years, like maybe the, the the sentiment of the church changed so much. But that's definitely not Francis' opinion. He believed the sentiment changed doctrine back in the sixties. But uh, but this is a clear example, right? It, it, in the Roman Catholics I know are pretty like, yeah, it's just Francis is wrong in traditions. Yeah. All right. So you're not saying it's a defeater for Roman Catholicism. That's all I really want to get to. No. Um, I, th so I think this, the issue with the second bank of council is a defeater in by consequence, by like logical conclusion, How? but not in itself. Right. I think personally, if I, if I just show that Francis is wrong about the Second Vatican Council and its uh, compatibility with the traditional Latin Mass, then his error doesn't really bind me in any way. Yeah, right. I, I think the most coherent Roman Catholic opinion, at least if you're going to believe Francis is Pope or Benedict is Pope, the most coherent Roman Catholic opinion is Lefebvreism. Like, okay, I, I think that's. I think that is the most that that has the best explanatory power. Okay, and just to be clear, you're speaking as someone who was a Lefebvreist. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. All right. I'm a tad, I'm a tad biased. I'll grant that. The, um, oh, then look, look, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm yeah. not saying you're, uh, because you're biased, we're all biased. Like, yeah. I'm, 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 just pointing, I'm just pointing out that um, uh, this is kind of like what you're coming to the table with. doesn't mean you're wrong. It's just... Oh, yeah. Condemning the Novus Ordo is my bread and butter. Yeah. All right. But let's, all right, but uh, let's get back to it. So, in conform so the point of the Second Vatican Council was to make way for a new liturgy. And that's exactly what the liturgy of Pope Paul VI was doing. It was making way for a new liturgy. Um, and, of course, it did so by um, adding uh, additional Eucharistic prayers, uh, redacting some in the uh, first, redacting some in the um, in the first Eucharistic prayer, and of course by doing so, uh, this is where the reform of the liturgy happened, and that's why the liturgical books of uh, Pope Paul VI and Pope John Paul II 
Um, that's why they're in continu continuity with the Second Vatican Council, and that's why the traditional Latin Mass isn't. Not because it contradicts anything liturgically, start, not because it contradicts anything um, doctrinally in the Second Vatican Council, but because um, it didn't, because it's not what gave rise to or gave origin to the Nuvus Ordo Missae. I guess that's, that's kind of how I'm understanding. I don't really see any argument that's, I don't really see anything that Pope Francis is saying as to suggest that it contradicts Vatican II. He says it's the only, exp he says it is the only expression of the Lex Credundi of, uh, sorry, the Lex Arundi of the Roman Rite. Yeah, I grant he says that, but that's just a matter of the fact that a new Roman Rite was promulgated after second, after the Second Vatican Council. Like I, I guess the issue that is is here, um, if the Second Vatican Council, mm -hmm. as the conservatives and only the conservatives believe, if the Second Vatican Council, all it did was explain the same faith, the same substance, in a new way, then there would then. And if the same thing with uh, the liturgical reform, if that was simply removing some accretions but expressing the same lux arandi, then the result of that would be, oh, and, and, and considering, and wherever, and, and considering that the traditional Latin Roman liturgy was never fully abrogated, at least, even if you believe it is abrogated by like the promulgation of the Novus Ordo Messiae, it was then permitted again by uh, in the with like the Agatha Christie indult. So at least there in England, you would have to say, "Oh, well, if the, nothing changes doctrinally in substance and nothing liturgically in substance, then both the traditional Roman liturgy and the Novus Ordo Messiae, um, both of them express the one." Luxorandi, right? Which is Benedict's ar ben, uh, Benedict the Sixteenth's argument. It's like, hey, like these are all things allowed. Not only are they all things allowed, but because there's complete continuity and there's no change in faith, therefore they both express the Luxor the Luxorandi. The problem with saying that only the Novus Ordo Missae does, and also by not juridically abrogating it but permitting its expression, is you have this issue of, yeah, it's there, but it does not express the Luxorandi. And if it doesn't express the Lux Rondi, it doesn't express the Lux Credendi. That's the issue. Because if nothing changed in Vatican II, then both of them would be expressions of the Lux Rondi. Hmm. So if they were both express, All right. So the argument made by... So if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is the argument made by Benedict is that they both express the Lux Rondi, and hence, because they were two expressions of the same right... It can therefore be said that, um, ooga booga, uh, it can therefore be, okay, I don't I know why, this is why you should Sorry. stop. I have a bad <laughs> habit of reading comments while on, on StreamYard. This is why I much prefer, if possible, to ignore the comment section of the chat, but, uh, my, uh, OCD brain just can't do so, so I get sidetracked so easily. All right. Let's see, uh, but in any case, uh, what was I saying? Oh, right. So his argument was, that, as you were saying, that, oh, they're both set as being the Luxorandi, as an expression of the Luxorandi. And, and, and because that's the case, then there is no contradiction with the Second Vatican Council because they're both the same expressions of the same faith that can be said. Whereas what you're saying, it, and what you're also saying is because Pope Francis is going back on that and just making the Novus Ordo Missae the uh, unique expression of the Roman Rite, then that seems to imply that um, the extraordinary form isn't going to be something that is, uh, how should I say it, uh, something that can be expressed with the Second Vatican Council because it's not in a in accord with it there seems to be a contradiction going on here is, is that yeah, what's yeah. being said but, that would be my argument all right so i do want to say something um about so did you read the official letter that accompanied um trid, that accompanied the motu proprio from pope francis 
Okay, let's see. It's worse than the episodic letter itself. In making their decisions, they were confident that such a provision would not place in doubt one of the key measures of Vatican II or minimize in the way its authority. The motu proprio recognized that, in its own right, the missal promulgated by Paul VI is the ordinary expression of the Lex Orandi of the Catholic Church of the Roman Rite. The recognition of the missal promulgated by St. Pius V as an extraordinary the expression of Lex Orandi did not in any way underrate the liturgical reform but was decreed with the desire to acknowledge the insistent prayers of the faithful, allowing them to celebrate the sacrifice of the Mass according to the uh, Editio Typica of the Roman Missal promulgated by John the Twenty Third uh, in 1962 and never abrogated as the extraordinary form of the Church. It comforted Benedict the Sixteenth in his discernment that desired to find the form of the sacred liturgy dear to them clearly accepted the binding character of the Vatican Council and were faithful to the Pope and the bishops. What is more, he declared to be unfounded the fear of division in parish communities because the two forms of the use of the rite would enrich one another. Thus, he invited the bishops to set aside their doubts and fears and to welcome the norms, attend that everything would proceed in peace and, sin and serenity, with the promise that it would be possible to find resolutions. In the event that serious difficulties came to light, in the implementation of the norms once the motu proprio came into effect. With the passage of 13 years, I instructed the CDC, uh, CDF. To, sorry, the CDF, uh, to circulate a questionnaire to the bishops regarding the implementation of the motu proprio. The response reveals a situation that preoccupies and saddens me and persuades me to intervene. Uh, regrettably, the pastoral objective of my predecessor was who uh, predecessors who intended to do everything possible to ensure those who truly possess the desire for unity would find it possible to remain in unity and to discover it anew has uh, be, has often been seriously disregarded. An op so it does seem like his intention, at least when I read the part the part of the motu proprio preceding the articles was that he read Pope Benedict as offering a pastoral uh, justification for his articles and then proceeding to override them. So it, so at least from that section, it seems that it, he did view it as a judicial matter. Well, there is a judicial matter, which is giving, um, giving the right to celebrate the traditional Roman liturgy to every priest. That, that's, that doesn't have anything to do with the expression of Lex Rondi. That, that is a ju judicial matter based on who can celebrate what. Kind of the same way that like preaching doesn't have to be given to every priest or the right to hear confessions to every priest, right? Even though we would say, obviously, the um, book of the, the, you know, the ritual or the, I don't know what it's called in the modern, Basically, the liturgy is for penance, right? That's the that's part of the lex orandi, uh, an expression of the lex orandi, even though not every priest has the authority to hear confessions. So here, one, he, he very clearly dissents from what Benedict says, right? I think it's uh, in the sense of Francis, right? He, he says, oh, Benedict said mm. that it was never abrogated, right? which he did say that and i'm not sure that francis would actually agree with that because he views the continued celebration of traditional roman liturgy not as a practice of a use or of an expression of the roman ritual or uh, roman rite, but as something that needs to be abandoned so you return to the a unitary liturgical expression uh but the question there for me is still then why right why is it that it causes such a problem now one i think he's wrong about benedict benedict did not do this as a salute as a merely pastoral solution benedict in benedict benedict's words what was good yesterday what was good and fruitful yesterday is good and fruitful today it was benedict's concern with continuity of doctrine which, it, which prompted the uh, Summor Pontificum. And Francis just kind of either denies it or omits it. But further, I if if you hold Francis's view that the Lux Arandi and Lux Credendi change at Vatican Council II, and you see people dissenting, 
then duh, you want to get rid of it, right? You want to get rid of the provision that allows such a wide uh, use of it. Like, it makes sense to me at least, right? Why, like in that framework? Well, I mean, it doesn't to me because if you were to say, I'm the Pope, I can get rid of it because of modern sentiment, then you could just say, yeah, my predecessor said this and I acknowledge it. However, he's wrong. And that's because of the sentiment. Like, so, so here, that's here, here, like... Here, so like, yeah. if he was such a modernist and he's the Pope, you should that's just not, be the Pope. That's not how modernists talk, right? So let me, uh, for example. Oh, that, oh, okay. Go on. Let me quote from uh, Raymond Brown. So Father Raymond Brown, I believe he was in good standing with the Roman Church for his entire life. Um, he followed the Nouvelle Theology, um, and he said something very interesting. He said um, in, his, in his book, uh, The Critical Meaning of the Bible, Essential to a critical, and when he says critical, mean read accurate. Essential to a critical interpretation of church documents is the realization that the Roman Catholic Church does not change her official stance in a blunt way. Past statements are not rejected, but are requoted with praise and then reinterpreted at the same time. He's right. He's completely correct about like, like that is, even if you agree that that hasn't happened in history on a magisterial level, if you're really committed to that, but that is how modernists and modernists just under a new name called Nouvelle Theologie, that is exactly how they act. That's ex they never do it in a blunt way. They take the old terms and they give, they fill them with new meaning. That's the key her That's the key error of uh, modernism is to take orthodox language take out the orthodox meaning and to put in um her uh, heretical meaning so when he when he when he applies it to scriptural theology he says it is false uh, that is very brown he says it is falsely claimed that there has been no change towards the bible in the catholic church in catholic church thought because Pius XII and vatican ii paid homage to documents issued by leo the 13th Pius the 10th and benedict the 15th and therefore clearly meant to reinforce the teaching of their predecessors what really was going on was an attempt gracefully to retain what was salvageable from the past and to move in a new direction with as little friction as possible. So if anyone reads the Second Vatican document uh, that uh, Father Raymond Brown is referring to, he's referring to De Verbum. And De Verbum, if, you, if anyone reads it just in any plain, ordinary sense of the word, it's just reappropriating uh, inerrancy of scripture. And well, like, it, like when I read it as a, as a candidate, I, I read it as limited inerrancy. Uh, I and that's what it taught to me, and that's what's in um, every in the New American Bible's footnotes. Yeah, unfortunately, if anyone looks at Father Raymond Brown or uh, most others, it's something that's super limited, and he has to do a lot of damage to just the plain, ordinary sense of De Verbum in order to have a, that limited inerrancy view. Uh, I, I, and and it, the it, reason and and hold on. The reason why I would say he's not really a modernist is because I don't think he's theologically adept enough to be a modernist. Uh, Father's, Father Raymond Brown's background was in biblical criticism, not in theology. That's the first thing. Secondly, if anyone actually reads uh, the Nouvelle Theolog Theology guys, they actually are very, they actually do get into a lot of metaphysics. Um, they're not people who just uh, ignore uh, metaphysical thought and idea. Uh, whereas modernists were usually Kantians or Hegelians. Um, they were people who just avoided metaphysical thought and speculation entirely. Um, so I, I don't think that they were modernists, at, at the very least in that sense. I think that these are guys who um, have views at odds with the Catholic Church, and they just try to read around the text. And that's something that it's not unique to modernists. Everyone, whatever they find a passage in scripture or any uh, document that they hold as binding, but is at odds with uh, their theology, they have to say, okay, how can I interpret it at least in light that allows or permits my theological perspective? Just read uh, Anglo-Catholics on the 39 articles. Or So I'm sorry, but if anyone reads the 39 articles competently, you cannot really get a lot of the, ca the, the Anglo-Catholic stuff. We, we can talk about that another time. I think. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm I, sorry. I think, 
they like people read it and it's like ah the, the almost as if puritans wrote it but um yeah i'm not, I get, I'm not gonna I, say that but i will so i'm not gonna say that i think that there is a lot of uh, lit, uh liturgical stuff that i think a lot of anglicans especially uh, specifically the evangelical types overreacted against um uh, specific uh, but i'm not gonna say uh, but you know there have been anglo-catholics who wanted to do things like the intercession of the saints which is clearly condemned in the 39 articles and in the homilies which are pretty decent expositions of the 39 articles theology as even the 39 articles are to say that they are yeah I, i'm simply saying uh, when i quote father terrell and I, when i quote father brown mm -hmm. i'm simply saying these are formative for the same theological thought that mm -hmm. francis by right okay and so i'm just saying like hey they were taught this this is what they're how it was explained and especially having been um formed around the time when these new expressions are coming about in theology and having been the um what was it, the provincial superior in the 70s and like the the all his formative years of theology were in we're steeped in this that's why i say it's not surprising like you can try to square i don't know grammatically how you do it but you can try to square it with a continuitist view but clearly francis is saying there isn't continuity right because you you know because even you admit you have to ditch with with some of the stuff that benedict says about um about the roman liturgy uh, for example, that the Church of Roman liturgy was was never abrogated to make sense of what exists now, right? So, so, so that's all I'm saying. Uh, that's all I'm saying is that it's clear from his theological background and who he is that this is that this makes sense. It's something I mean, crazy. I mean, if you look at his letter accompanying the motu proprio, his biggest influence was Pope Pius V and what he did in the Council of Trent. Well, he uses it as a justification for doing what he does now, but that's that's exactly what Father Brown says the magisterium does. It says that past statements are not rejected, but are requoted with are requoted with praise, and then reinterpreted at the same time. This is this this is pretty much a standard liberal playbook. He's he's going right according to the rules. But he's not even redefine. But he's not even doing that much he's just he's not quoting something like like a phrase or something he's actually saying this is um an action of legislation that has precedent in the church like oh yeah he's doing that, right uh yeah. where we, we, i'm not saying there's no juridical change i'm just saying luxorandi is a doctrinal category okay um, do you want to you want to wrap up or do you want to say something you can have the last word if you want if you I'll just quote Pope Francis and then we'll, we'll end here. Right. For, for four centuries, the Roman Missal promulgated by St. Pius V was the principal expression of the Lex Arande of the Roman Rite and functioned to maintain the unity of the Church without denying the dignity and grandeur of his rite. The Pope, gathered in ecumenical council, asked that it be reformed. Their intention was that the faithful would not assist as strangers and silent spectators in the mystery of the faith, but with full understanding of the rites and prayers, would participate in the sacred action and piously and actively. St. Uh, Paul VI, uh, recalling that the work adapted of the Roman Missal had already been initiated by Pius XII, declared that the revision of the Roman Missal carried out in light of the ancient liturgical sources had the goal of permitting the church to rise up in the variety of language a single and identical prayer that expressed her unity this unity i intended to re-establish throughout the church of the roman rite so this so i'll i'll leave francis's words there but they expressed the intention they expressed the lux Arundi, they uh, and his understanding of it they express it in terms of precedent with the church and he and it's not like he and he doesn't think he's changing anything with regards to doctrine but rather the mode of expression and i and i think if that's the case that this is what his intentions are i'm going to take his word on it rather uh, i'm going to just take his word on it as a faithful catholic now yeah. i think 
I'll also just say one more thing. This probably does require a bit more thought and research and understanding because, you know, uh, doc legal doctrine, uh, legal documents uh, should not just have a cursory glance and just set that, and you shouldn't just settle on one thing. But at the very least, it requires more thought, and hopefully, maybe in the future, we'll have another discussion on the matter. Yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time. I know that's a lot, and I know, um, so I just appreciate uh, you taking the time to come on. Yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me. It's uh, it's not too often that um, someone who disagrees with me, you know, gives me all this time to talk. Um, so thank you. You are a char you are a charitable interlocutor, and uh, yeah, nice. Uh, thank you also, everyone. Um, I didn't expect a an argument about an apostolic letter containing a motu proprio to have the greatest viewership, um, but I do everyone, appreciate everyone who did come. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I did want to answer this. Um, I shaved it for Easter, and it's not coming back. Good. No offense. Good. It's, no offense, but a lot of guys cannot rock a mustache. I like it, what's weird. It was, I was it, everyone was split. Half the people I met, they're like, "Oh, it looks great." Half the people, please get rid of it. I'm like, I don't know, man. You can't go wrong with a clean shave. You can't go wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, then I have to remember to shave. No, I, I mean in terms of fashion. I know, but now I have now I have to shave. Shaving's awesome. It, no, no. All right. I mean, you uh, also have to shave with the mustache too, by the way. Well, yeah, but you can get away with with not shaving as much. Yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, everyone, every everything else was like, oh yeah, call up Unini and Archbishop Roach. Archbishop Roach is the worst thing to come out of England in the in the twenty the last few years um but everything else was like we want a catholic book of common prayers which um i do too um, uh go to the ordinariate have one everyone's complaining like it, it's funny having been a member of the ordinariate that I've is attended a very an ordinary mass. i've attended an ordinary mass near me i enjoyed it yeah. i liked it oh, yeah it, it, yeah um it's funny being having been a member of the ordinariate everyone complains like why don't we have a bcp and i'm like i i don't know why we don't have a bcp um but everything else is like talk like talk about random different doctrines and we, i don't think we have the time for that mm. but um the B the book of common prayer the book of common prayer is catholic thank you uh, f actually so i'll say this much if you read michael davies book on uh cranmer and the english reformation um there is an appendix section where he answers the theological question if a properly ordained priest was to say the bcp would it be valid and he cites catholic uh, liter uh sacramentologists and they say yes it would because the words of institution were uh, formulated by Christ himself, and because you can't question Christ's own for, um, intention and formulation um, in the matter, then those are safeguarded, just like a formula of baptism is. So even though I'd say the BCP does away with a lot of great things found in the Serum Pontifical, um, it, it would still it would still be valid. Nice. If, All right. Well, uh, I think we'll we'll finish here then. Again, thanks for coming on, and I look forward to future discussions. I do too. Uh, maybe the thirty nine articles in the future. Well, I have a video on the apocrypha coming up, which I'm sure you'll disagree with. So, um, maybe. I mean, not. do you at least take the better Anglican position that uh, the books are profitable for reading, even in mass, even though they're yeah. not profitable for deriving doctrine? That's why I can't use Roman Catholic Bibles is my office requires me to read second Esdras, and no roman catholic bible has second Esdras, and you get anglican bibles to get that book oh or you know a 1611 copy of the king james oh yeah anglican yeah and you get anglican books like oh, king yeah. james esb and apocrypha all the roman catholic books remove all, all of the ones i need or not all of them but they remove books i need to pray i'm like i thought martin luther removed all the books 
Yeah, he removed all the books. That's why they're found in his Bibles, because he removed all of them. Every I, single one. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, that's typically the pop Catholic apologetic. Uh, but uh, no, he even he didn't. Uh, he just I, I, he just took the position that you know those books, and this was like Erasmus's position too. It was Erasmus, Cajetan, and Cajetan. Yeah, it was it was popular. It was actually a view popular amongst um, uh, certain Catholics in the. Uh, uh, Certain Catholics, uh, after the uh, discovery of biblical criticism, well, that... even even before, like you know, what's really cool mm. in in the Gratian Decretals, mm. there is a um a commentary written by a medieval hand that is, that um because they're basically talking about the word apocrypha in a different context. Yeah, like, yeah, apocrypha, like those books we don't believe are inspired, and I'm like. Oh, so Apocrypha is just the Western canon law term for those books. Hmm. It's yeah. Cool. I, I, yeah, that it is. Um, there, I mean, Chen, I mean, I think uh, everyone's going to have to say that, uh, you know, the canon develops. It's just you have to argue the other one is just a corrupt development. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for coming on, and I'll let you go. All right. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to you later.